And this recording is for the Dixon Public Library. Arnold, you're standing next to something. Uh, what is that? This is a forge that came off of the G.A. Sykes Ranch out in Tremont Township. When uh, they moved into town, he told me, he says, if you want this old forge, you can have it. It's worthless. But I think it's about 1880 vintage. Uh, we have converted it into a useful piece of equipment here because we use it for our barbecue. Mm-hmm. Now, how's that work? You, you blow air on there to get everything going, right? Well, I've, this is just an old-style forge, and you can, you can kick up a pretty good steam out of it. It's just blowing ash at this time, but uh, you can stand here and crank it up, and it'll really get a hot fire for you in a hurry. Uh-huh. Now, that, that in front of you there, I recognize that. That's, a, that's an anvil, right? That's an old anvil, and it came off of the... Uh, Repke Brothers Ranch, also in Tremont Township. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's been used so much that the edge of the anvil is, is kind of rounded from pounding iron on it and so forth. The elder Repke, the senior Repke of the family, uh, when they came from Germany, he came as a shipwright. And that's why he used this anvil extensively, probably from 1850 or 60 on. Hmm. Now this is just a small part of your collection. I understand out in the back you got a lot more. Yes, we have. We have uh, a lot of uh, artic articles that we picked up at the ranch and off of the, uh, the several ranches that I farmed because I farmed the Smith Place, uh, the Repke Place, the Sykes Ranch, and uh, my mother's estate, and uh, a place of my uncle. Well, well let's, let's go out there and, and take a look at things. All right. Hey, okay, now we're out in the backyard. Now, Arnold, you got a whole wall full of stuff. Uh, what do you got here? What well, is this collection? This is just a collection of stuff that I've picked up on the various ranches that I farm. Uh, some of them I used when I first started to farm. Like, for instance, this cedar here. I planted my first field of alfalfa and also my first field of ladino with this. And I have my wife drive the pickup, and I'd sit in the back of the pickup and scatter the seed. Uh -huh. uh, there's just lots of things that are used here. It's part of an old forge. Uh, I mean, the tongs off the forge. And uh, here's an old car jack. Uh, here's a, a lead label that came off of the Kernig Brothers Ranch. And uh, this is a crowbar that was made by the Ripke family. And this is a drive shaft off of an old star car. An old star car, you said. Old star car. Uh -huh. This I have. Uh, I have a, a hay knife here. In California, they are called hay knives. In Minnesota, they're called ice knives. But they were used to cut the hay so that you could get it out of the barn when it was put in there and packed really tight. Um, down here is a cylinder from an old Douglas pump. And the Douglas pump played a big role in farming in California because they would dig a well maybe 20 feet deep in those days and put down a single cylinder and pump water out of the ground at maybe only 8 or 10 feet. But that's all changed today. Hmm. We have a set of ice tongs that uh, the guy used to deliver ice out to the ranch. And uh, I came up for this set of ice tongs. I guess he got tired of his job and quit. Uh, here is that's the cylinder of the Douglas pump, and here's the old Douglas pump itself. It's got its handle broke off. Uh, this is a kind of an interesting piece of equipment. Everybody that sees this, especially kids, want to know what this is. Well, this is really a washing machine. The hired help in those days used to cut the top out of a kerosene can, and they put their clothes in it on Sunday, and then work this up and down, and that was their washing machine. So that's that's the agitator of the washing machine. Yeah, that was the cold unit built into one. Uh -huh. You just had to supply the power. Uh, this is a kind of a, an odd deal because I picked this up when I was back in Tennessee to say, see my son. And this seat is off of what they used to call a go devil cultivator. And I'm pretty sure at some time or other a slave has been sitting in this seat. This little deal down here is an old shoe repair deal. I. Uh, uh, thought this should be out here because my uh, great-grandfather, when he came to California across the plains, he was 
a cobbler by trade, and he worked in Sacramento as a cobbler, and so he repaired shoes. But when I was a kid, I had to repair my own shoes. There's a couple of old steel traps that were mine when I used to run a trap line when I was in grammar school. In well, the last what two, were you trapping? Years, I was in school. Well, what sort of animal were you after? Yeah, well, that's right. The coyotes and things? What were you, uh, trapping coyotes? Uh, no, skunk. Skunk, skunk only. Oh, yeah. yeah. And if you skinned a skunk the night, one night, you didn't smell very good for your classes the next day. <laughs> Here's another hay knife. Uh, let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, this is a shovel. One of the boys out at the ranch, one of the Spanish or Mexican boys, thought this would be a good idea so he could shovel and let the water go through the shovel and hold on to the dirt. But this is what he come up with. Now, uh, this is part of a, of a government survey deal that went down in the ground. Uh, I did not steal this because it says this is a $250 fine, but the Southern Pacific tore it out of the ground and I just picked it up before it was completely destroyed. That, that's a survey marker. That's a survey marker, yeah. Uh -huh. that's right. Here we have, going around this headstone, this is a solid rubber tire that at one time was the only kind of tire you got on trucks. Now, if you just look at the, that, that thing and you can realize how the hard ride you would have. Hmm. Um, here's, here's an old uh, bit. I imagine it was probably used by a, one of the early settlers, maybe even by uh, some of the early Spanish people that were here in this area. This is a straw fort. Now, people say, look at this thing and say, well, that's just a pitch fort. But no, that has a little deal that goes behind to hold the straw on your fort. Uh, this is an old high school project that I made, uh, and I was real proud of that when I finished it. It took me probably you know, a month to complete that, a couple of hours a day. That's a that's a jack, huh? That's a jack. That's a screw screw jack. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the uh, this is a hub off of a wagon that was originally built by the Carpenter family in in Sylviaville. This little crooked piece of pipe is kind of interesting to me. It may not be to some people, but at one time the Southern Pacific, when they first put the line in. They would not let you put any telephone lines over top of the railroad track because of the high uh, uh, smoke uh, exhaust yield on the, on the train. But this, the farmers in those days would drive this piece of pipe underneath the railroad track and then run a telephone line through it so that they could communicate with people in town. Uh, these are a few things off of wagons and so forth. Uh, I guess that's about the extent of it. Everybody used one of these, an old tire pump, where you had to pump up your own tires uh, uh, to, before you could get, get into town to get the groceries. This is a part of an old Jackson Fort. Uh, not a Jackson Fort, but a, uh, a push Fort that we used out at the ranch. And uh, that was a handy tool when we first had help out. There's an old monkey wrench. I think it's been monkey grip for the last time. I think it's pretty well set there. Hmm. I think that about completes this. Okay, let's go inside and talk for a while. All righty, fine. Okay, well, let's see. This recording for the Dixon Public Library of the Oral History Project. Today, July 17th, 1998, I'm talking to Arnold Collier in his home here in Dixon and my name's Paul Farrell and we're going to talk about Dixon uh, but first let's get some family history uh, what you happen to know of your family history how far back do you know? Well uh, my uh, great-grandfather and my great-grandmother of course came across the prairie in 1852 with nine siblings two boys and seven girls uh, he arrived in Sacramento. He immediately found work at his trade at that time, which was as a cobbler. He worked there for uh, several years, and then he got involved in hotel management in, uh, well, it's uh, one of the buildings in old Sacramento. Uh, 
in later years, and then he moved out to Dixon uh, in the Sylviaville area and uh, bought a piece of property. Uh, he was there, he farmed for several years, and then he got disgusted with California. I guess it surely wasn't because of the uh, population in California, but anyhow he decided to take his entire family back to uh, the East Coast where he would originally came down from when he, he uh, first came over here as a boy from Ireland. But anyhow, uh, they got on the Yankee Blade, which sunk down by Santa Barbara, and there was no loss of life. They hit some rocks that they, like he said, there was just lots of suffering. Anyhow, they were all picked up. He came back to Dixon, made a deal with the fellow he sold his ranch to, and decided to stay in Dixon. He'd had enough of that ocean. But uh, my grandfather, uh, A.B. Holdridge, uh, he selected another way to come. He had fished in his youth, so he jumped the ship and crossed the isthmus of the Panama and came to California. He worked for several years as a freighter from the Sacramento area to uh, Placerville and Auburn and all the gold mining towns. He had his own team and that was where there was quite good money in those days as uh, to move freight from Sacramento on up there. Did, did any of these old relatives of yours, did they ever try their hand at getting gold? If he did, he didn't talk about it, so I don't think he had much luck. Uh -huh. uh, uh, he went into business and, and then he came down to Dixon and bought uh, 160 acres first and kept adding to it till he finally had eight or nine hundred acres. Uh, he married one of the Hall girls, Mary Priscilla, and uh, they had uh, uh, I think four children, but only three of them survived. At, um, as time went by, uh, in uh, the 1900s, my dad came out here from tennis, uh, from Cal uh, Kentucky, and uh, he was relation or a, a distant relation to the Garnets who had already settled here, and of course he met my mother, who was one of the daughters of A. B. Holdridge, and he married her. Uh, they settled in Dixon. He became my livestock dealer, uh, which he was quite prominent for a number of years, uh, even up until the time of his death in an automobile accident in, in uh, 1965, I remember, as I remember. Now you say livestock, uh, uh, yeah, I livestock. Uh, sheep, is it? Or well, he ran some sheep and mm -hmm. he always kind of had, uh, did work with hogs, but hogs and sheep were the, uh, the main products that he bought and sold and traded and shipped to San Francisco and shipped to Chicago, uh, wherever there was a market mm -hmm. this, for anything, any of that land, uh, any livestock like that. And in those days there was a lot of lambs in this area and sometimes he would ship as high as 35, 36 carloads of lambs at one time to the Chicago market. I mean 36 and train train loads, yes. Uh, uh, and, uh, when he would, they would generally send two employees with them, and they were unloaded in Salt Lake and sometimes uh, Nebraska to be fed. But this was a common practice in those days because there wasn't trucks, there wasn't the refrigeration to ship the meat, and process it here and ship it back east and this sort of thing. Today, meat moves from one continent to the other under refrigeration. But, no, no, uh, that, uh I don't know anything about farming, or not much, but I'd imagine that many sheep must take a lot of land. How much How much acreage would you Well, they, he would buy the lambs. Oh, I see. see. He, he, was he would buy the lambs boat. from maybe 25 or 30 guys, uh, mm -hmm. people, and they would come into the old Granger Business Association, which used to be uh, kind of across the street from the Dixon Methodist Church at this time, and they were shipped out of there. It was uh, it was a business. He wasn't the only livestock buyer in the Dixon area, but when he was operating, he was one of the largest. Uh, in later years, he worked for somebody else and just bought lambs for Mr. Vaughn at that time. Mm -hmm. And he also bought livestock for the C. Bruce Mace slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. 
that, uh, that just about completes the family. That uh, brings up to you now, uh, when were you born? I was born in 1916 at Third Ranch out on uh, at the corner of Tremont and Robin Road. Uh, or so, like a lot of kids, I went uh, through high school and I and I got out. My sole desire was to become a farmer, and uh, my folks, fortunately enough, let me become a farmer. And uh, I uh, raised my first crop of beets, only 10 acres, but it was my crop, and I was 18 years old. But uh, uh, then I uh, acquired a little piece of property through the help of my mother and whatnot, and and uh, then in, in 1937 I got married. So that's the start of my life. Well, now, now as a as a little boy, you were growing up on a farm. But, yes. Uh, I don't know. I hear stories of uh, people saying that uh, oh, that's the last thing they want to do. They want to get away from the farm. But you say you loved it. Well. Uh, I guess I was farm-oriented. Uh, um, there was some land there available for me to farm, and so I took advantage of it. I didn't uh, uh, go on to college, although I probably could have, but I elected to go the other way and and uh, get my hands dirty. Well, tell me about the, that family farm uh, when you were a kid. Uh, what all did you raise there? Well, I wasn't on a family farm. I was on my own farm when I started, but I leased ground from my mother and I leased ground from other people. But uh, no, but I mean, when you were back, back your earliest memories. Now, well, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, farming in those days where uh, everybody had uh, maybe a hundred head of sheep, three or four brood sows, and they raised their own meat. Uh, we always in the uh, winter time. Uh, my dad always killed uh, five or six hogs, and and we would put down our own lard and fix our own sausage, and and uh, ate a lot of fresh pork when it, when it was available and this sort of thing. But but uh, it was uh, sides of bacon were uh, were salted down and kept that way, and uh, it was a different life compared to what we see today, because we can go to the store and buy anything, but. Uh, uh, pretty near every ranch was uh, almost self-sufficient on what they raised. Uh, they had to buy flour, they had to buy some, some staples, but after they bought the flour they made the bread. But, uh, now how did these, these ranches get, well of course ranches got connected to town with, with the roads. Uh, were the roads, uh, what kind of shape were the roads in back in the earliest times you remember? Well. I'll tell you what, when I got my first bicycle, all we had to ride on was a gravel road. And if you had a little track where the cars had run down, you'd try to keep your bicycle on that. But if you hit that loose gravel off the side, you were flat on your face or on your back because uh, it would throw your bicycle all out of kilter. But after, after you had three or four falls, you got to where you managed the bicycle pretty well. But uh, uh, the roads weren't much. Sometimes in the winter time, uh, you'd have to stay home for uh, three or four days because you couldn't get through the roads because of the ruts that had been cut by the cars, and you'd only go down there and get stuck, and and that's when they'd get a team to pull you out. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, and then of course when the weather got good in the spring, then the county run a grader up and down the road and shaped the road up again, and you'd start all over again. But the uh, roads were weren't paved until probably oh in the 19 40 41 to and, and through there so there was there was a long time they were just gravel roads mm -hmm. and uh, in the summertime they were fine they had a pretty good surface on them and then alongside of each road there was always a, a what we called a wagon road because the the fellows that were uh, moving stuff with their team, uh, especially when they were, ret were, were returning, they liked to have soft dirt for their uh, animals to walk into because uh, a lot of them weren't shod and they were just walking on their regular hoofs and it, uh, if they walked on the gravel road all the time, some of their feet would get a little bit tender and their hooves would wear off, so mm. they liked a side road to run their animals on. Well. What about that uh, 
back in the early, early days of, of the 1920s, uh, did everybody have cars or were people still out there with, with horses? Well, the first car that I can remember in, in uh, my family was a Dodge Touring car. Uh, I know when you went out in the rain, you had to put on the little, uh, what I call Eisenglass uh, side curtains and had little kind of peak holes in them that you couldn't hardly see out of, but at least it kept the rain out of the car. But that was about, uh, oh, I imagine 1920, 1921, two, sometime in through there. Uh, that's kind of the first remembrance I have, because I was born in 16, so I've been three or four years, years old. It may have been a little bit earlier than that, I just can't recall. Now, oh, another thing, uh, I wonder if you were around uh, when the first electricity got, got wired out to the farms. Well, yes and no. Um, when my folks built their house in 1909, I believe it was, well, they were fortunate because electricity had just begun to come into that area, and they, they were the last house on the electric line for that particular electric line because they would they would try and take in four or five uh, people with electricity and if nobody wanted on down the line and a lot of people used lamps and used letters and whatnot for their chores and whatnot uh, so they didn't want anything to do with electricity although uh, probably in the 1930s well uh, uh, late 20s and thir early 30s, a lot of them did go ahead and extend the line, and it didn't cost very much. PG&E was quite cooperative in giving you so much footage for each uh, thing that you bought. If you bought a water heater, you got so much footage. If you bought uh, put in an electric stove, you got so much footage, and you might have to, might have two or three of those things, and then you may have to put up a little bit of cash to get the line in, but things were a lot cheaper than they are today. Now everybody out there using uh, lamps and lanterns, uh, wouldn't there be a danger of uh, fire using lanterns and such? <laughs> well, there was always a danger of fire with anything that had, a, had kerosene and a wick in it, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, people got to where they were quite careful and what they did because that's what they were used to, you know. They, uh, I know my granddad uh, in later years, he owned the old Palace Hotel in Dixon here and I remember going through several of his insurance policies on the building and it said specifically that there was no more than five gallons of kerosene at one time to be stored on the grounds. And that was back in the days when even the people in hotels used lamps because uh, he owned that to uh, the 1890s to 1922. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, what about out there on the farm uh, as far as farm equipment goes? Uh, were people still using horses up until the 40s or was it all well, mechanized? Uh, yeah. They, uh, uh, People always had a, a team or two, but uh, by the time I got started to grow up uh, to, well, I can't remember, um, uh, there was quite a few old GI tractors from World War One that were sold to the public uh, to do farm work. Uh, uh, later on, uh, of course, the Caterpillar uh, become quite popular when was felt I had enough money to buy one, but uh, a lot of people bought the old GI engines, and uh, uh, some people, of course, had had uh, Caterpillar engines, and then Alice Chalmers come in with an engine, and uh, uh, into the 30s, pretty much everybody had gone to tractors and whatnot. But uh, prior to 1920, it was pretty much still pretty much done with teams because. Uh, uh, even some of the harvest was still done with teams. Mm -hmm. And I can remember when, oh, up as late as 19, oh, I would say, 
35 or 36, a fellow from Davis by the name of, of Punkin Rogers, and they farmed the old Armstrong track, and he still harvested with uh, uh, teams. And they would see those 18 or 20 teams strung out across the field, you know, but that's the way he did it. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah. I better turn this off. They had a little, little telephone interruption, but let's see, as I recall, you were talking about the, the last guy who used big teams of horses to... Uh, to yeah, I think mules he had, most of them, but... Mules. but uh, that, now, you said, you said 18 to 20? Well, yeah, they... Uh, Gee, that seems like a large well, amount of mules. It, 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 it depends on the size of the, size of the harvester. If the harvester was uh, a 20 foot harvester, it took a pretty good bunch of team uh, animals to handle all those things, you know? Hmm. But, well, let's stop it again. Yeah. Okay, we got, a, we got through a second telephone call. <laughs> uh, and, and what about telephones? What about telephones out on the ranch? Uh, did everybody have one? How'd that work? Uh, from, <clears throat> from the time I can remember, uh, we always had a telephone. Um, of course, uh, uh, like I s uh, mentioned, uh, my dad was a livestock dealer and he was lost without a telephone. But um, uh, I think pretty everybody had a telephone. A lot of people, originally, when they originally put in telephones, they put in what they called uh, barbed wire telephones. They would, all the fence posts were wooden and they would attach the telephone line on one end to the barbed wire and send the message across the field on a barbed wire and then pick it up on a regular, well, on some short poles that were put into the, to get into their property. But, um, uh, and there was always maybe four, three, four, five people on one line and uh, your ring was, was two bells, somebody else's ring was two bells, or three bells, somebody else's ring was two longs and a short or two shorts and a long. I mean, everybody knew what everybody else's ring was. And that's where they got in the habit of some people would kind of, on a ring, and their neighbor's phone would ring, they'd sneak down and just raise the receiver real easy and kind of find, find out what they were going to have for dinner that night or something else, you know. But um, I think uh, in, in general, uh, telephones were a vital part of the, of the community. It, uh, it uh, served well even when I was first married, oh, in 38, 39, we had an old crank type telephone on the back porch and, and uh, I remember one time when, when our second child was born and uh, my wife had a little trouble breastfeeding him and I called the doctor in Woodland to get some instructions from him and if he had just stepped outside of the Woodland Clinic at that time he could have heard me shouting down here <laughs> some 20 miles away because you did a lot of shouting at that time over the telephone because they weren't, well there was no uh, way to turn the volume up on <laughs> but um, they, they were a very vital part especially in the summertime when there's a fire would get started in the community so they could call the fire department. Well, speaking of electrical devices, uh, I guess a radio was was your entertainment out there on the farm. The radio was. I, we had the opportunity. I went to the little rural school, which was Fremont School, um, and uh, Tyke Thompson's dad uh, who had one of the first radios in the area and he brought it down to the school so that we heard the inauguration inauguration of I believe it was Herbert Hoover and that was about 1928 mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, we took off all morning we were sure glad to get the break from school lessons just to listen to that radio and and uh, I don't know how, I can't remember how well we could hear it, but we managed to hear it as long as he kept it on. I know that. Uh, what about uh, uh, entertainment, uh, recreation? When you were a small boy, if you ever had any time off from your ranch work, uh, what would you do? Well, uh, part of my recreation in those days was to come to town because. <clears throat> uh, at that time, Dixon 
has all diagonal parking in downtown. In other words, the area where they get about eight cars in would hold about 16 or 20 cars in those days because of the di diagonal parking. Mm -hmm. Even though the highway went right down Main Street and you would come to town and you would, you would shop uh, at uh, your favorite grocery store and after you got through shopping you may sit out in your car and, and everybody that knew you in town would come over to your car and you'd visit right on Main Street. And uh, of course there was always a, uh, a uh, uh, soda fountain in the drugstore. Sometimes when the parents got tired of the kids was hanging around the car they'd give them a, a quarter or something else and you'd go get a uh, root beer float or something down at the drugstore. You could get it for 10 or 15 cents in those days. They weren't very expensive. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a little social life out in the country, but uh, uh, nothing compared to what there is today. Uh, the schools always had entertainment or a Christmas program that they put on for the parents. Uh, uh, I can remember uh, the socials being carried on at the old Tremont Church. Uh, to uh, raise money and this sort of thing, but uh, uh, there was for the women. There was always the the Tremont Mite Society, and and a lot of people belong to that. It's still pretty active. It's one of the oldest uh, women's uh, organizations in the state of California, and it meets out at the old Tremont Church, out in uh, well, out on Tremont Road. Now, uh, coming into town, I guess one, one of the one of your uh, things to do would be to pick up the mail, or was the mail delivered out to your ranch? Uh, for a long time, uh, we had box three forty one, and uh, it went one and a half, one and a half, five. I could still open it today if I could get to the box, but but uh, it uh, uh, we picked up our mail in there. I think about probably about nineteen. Uh, have to be right. It's uh, probably about 1928 or 30. Then they start started rural mail delivery, and they delivered out in the country at that time. But prior to that, it was all you picked up stuff in a box. But a lot of people hated to give up their post office box in town because that was another meeting place to visit with people that you didn't see because uh, people were well the, the post office was just a place to see people because there was always somebody going in or out and everybody knew everybody in those days because mm -hmm. there wasn't that many people in Dixon. Well, what about some of the, uh, the old businesses in Dixon? You mentioned that uh, there was a soda fountain you could go to. Uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, the Kirby Drugstore had a, had a soda fountain uh -huh. and then later years a fellow by the name of uh, Bill Milligan started another drugstore and he also had a soda fountain. Uh, during probation, you could get any kind of a soda drink that you wanted at uh, Dawson's, uh, and uh, Dawson's even had a restaurant in the back end of it when it was across the street from where it is now. There was a Japanese restaurant there for a number of years. At, uh, uh. Now, uh, as far as businesses go, uh, what else did you, there was a theater. There is a theater. There's no more theaters in Dixon today, but there no, was back uh, then, wasn't there? Uh, no, when I was, and we used to go to the theater quite often. Uh, I forget when the new theater was built, but I imagine I was maybe ten years old when the place, what they call the theater now, was built. Uh, and that was built by a fellow by the name of Bill Gerlach, who had a soda fountain across the street too. Uh, uh, especially when prohibition went in, there wasn't any place for people to, to drink hard liquor, and uh, uh, soda fountains were quite a popular place. But uh, earlier than uh, when Bill Gerlach had that theater, there was another little theater that uh, was a couple of doors to the south of of the present theater, but uh, I don't know whether it's in where the beauty parlor is or whether it's in where the uh, uh, 
Mexican restaurant is now, but it's right in that area. Now, now you mentioned a, a Japanese restaurant. I never heard about that. Well, it wasn't. It was. It was run by Japanese, but they cooked all American food. Oh. There was no. Uh, in those days, uh, there was no Chinese restaurants or, or Japanese restaurants. You, you got all American food. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just the Japanese couple happened to run it. You know, I, I always hear about the uh, here in Dixon. It's it's the Germans and it's the Portuguese as the two big groups. Uh -huh. Now yourself, you're you're neither one, are you? You're <laughs> well, <laughs> Scotch Irish is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. See. Uh, on both sides of my family, uh, they had immigrated to this, to the United States long before the big rush of immigrants, because my grandparents on my mother's side were back in Connecticut um, during the uh, uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, my dad's folks uh, had moved out into Kentucky, and uh, you'd be surprised, because Kentucky at that time was a uh, kind of a satellite of, of Virginia, and uh, Harrodsburg, Kentucky, has just a lot of revolutionary history. But, but they were here earlier, and they didn't come in with the. Uh, they were of Scotch, Welsh, and English ancestry that came from England. Well, well, what about these these Germans in town? Somebody told me that uh, after World War One. Some German families uh, would change their name so that they wouldn't be identified as, as German. Well, it, it bothered some of them. Uh, some of them would change one letter in their name mm -hmm. uh, to make it sound more American or more uh, uh, Danish or more Swedish or something along that line. But uh, uh, I can only remember one family that uh, ever did that, and, and uh, a lot of the people called it by the old, the old name, the old pronunciation anyhow, so it didn't make that much difference. Well now you were, you were just two years old when, when the First World War ended, but uh, did, did that war have any effect really down here in Dixon that you know of? I can't, uh, I can't recall any and there was no effect in my family because there was nobody involved in the uh, service of their country at that time. As, uh, as my brother was older than I was, uh, I mean anybody that had two children and we had, uh, my folks had us two boys that, that uh, I don't think they took, uh, you had to stay home and take care of your family. Well something that happened there at the end of the war was the uh, Spanish uh, Influenza ep yes. epidemic of 1918. Of course, uh -huh. I I don't think you could remember that. But did you ever well, hear any stories about that? I I I have a very little recollection of that. Although I've I've known uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, one Portuguese family here that that uh, that uh, wiped out two of the brothers, and uh, that uh, the rest of the family stayed on and survived. Uh, now, something that happened after that, of course, is Prohibition. You, you mentioned Prohibition. Uh, did that have a big effect here on Dixon in the 1920s? Well, I, th I think it did. Uh, uh, of course, my dad came from Kentucky and uh, he and Bourbon always got along pretty good. Um, I know that uh, he always carried a bottle, which was a doctor's prescription. Uh, at least that's what he said it was. <laughs> but uh, I don't think any of the true uh, drinking people. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me quickly turn this tape over. Okay, I'm sorry. I let that run out. But now we're. Now we're recording again now. Okay. Now you're talking about yeah. Prohibition? Yeah, I think, uh, like my dad, uh, who always liked to drink, and my dad being a livestock buyer, uh, he did a lot of social drinking. In other words, uh, sometimes <laughs> uh, 
you didn't make a deal with the guy if you didn't buy him a drink, you know. I mean, and uh, it kind of mellowed people too. Uh, and let's face it, uh, that was part of the uh, lifestyle because there, at that time uh, uh, there was a lot of single men in Dixon that uh, followed the the uh, um, harvest season, and uh, then they'd come back and, and when tractors started up in the uh, fall of the year to put the grain in, they'd be back around to uh, drive a tractor and whatnot. And these boys lived downtown, and and uh, a lot of their evenings were spent in the bars to pass the time of day. There was no TV to watch in those days. Hmm. Well, uh, of course, after uh, Prohibition, I, I think they they ended that in 1933, and they're pretty so. well into the Depression. Uh, how did the Depression hit Dixon? Well, I think everybody suffered during the Depression. Um, uh, I know uh, uh, grain was down to 10 or 12 dollars a ton at one time. Then uh, wool, uh, wool was, they were trying to peddle wool for three or four cents a pound. They couldn't even get the, the fellows that sheared the sheep to take the wool cutting it off the back of a sheep and uh, those uh, that little those little periods uh, sometimes those periods that last two years sometimes three years but but uh, the people that bought a lot of wool and stored it made a lot of money off of it but they were not the farmers because they had to get what they could out of the their wool or their or their grain to to eat on you know mm. that uh, I know all the time I went uh, to high school, uh, my dad had made a deal with uh, the old red and white store here in Dixon that he would pay his bill when he sold his grain and again when he sold his lambs. And uh, the old guy that run the store, he said, well, he says, yeah, that's fine with me. He says, I, all I look at is if you can't pay Bob, there'll be a lot of other people that can't pay too. So. That's the way it was done. Hmm. Uh, you said a lot of these farms around here were more or less self-sufficient. That must have paid off when... when well, yeah, I think in, in uh, later years, you know, uh, as uh, canned products began to come into the stores, uh, originally when the first settlers were here, there wasn't, you couldn't go in town and buy, uh, we'll say, a, a can of peaches or a can of apricots. Uh, you had to put them up on your own place, mm -hmm. and that's everybody had a, 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 a cellar where they kept all this stuff, and and they had shelves down there, and and I can remember out that place going down to, to get a jar of strawberry jam, and it was it was all down there, all labeled and whatnot. But uh, we very seldom, in my earlier years, went to town to buy something like that. It was it was there. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, about schools around here. You, you said you went to uh, Tremont School? I went to Tremont School, the original school that was built there. Uh, I don't know when it was built, but it, my mother went to school there, so it, and she was born in 1887, so it was built there prior to the turn of the century. Uh, in fact, uh, my mother and my aunt and my uncle all went to school there, uh, grammar school, and then uh, they would come into high school. My mother did not because uh, she was the youngest in the family and, and my dad was, my, her father was uh, uh, a widower by that time, so uh, she stayed home. But uh, there used to be what they called the Dixon, Dixon Academy. And I think my aunt and my uncle both went to the Dixon Academy. Now, I don't know how that was like a, you might say, a junior high school or something is today, but, but they would go a couple of years to that. And uh, I know my uncle, uh, he went on to, after he graduated from that, he went on to Heald's Business College in San Francisco and uh, learned the accounting trade and whatnot uh, down there. But. Uh, uh, the high school, even when I went to high school, we only had, say, like 100 and, 110 students, uh, something like that. We had an exceptionally big class, 
and I think we graduated 36 or 37, but the class ahead of us only had 18 pupils, and the class behind us only had 18 pupils. So we had twice as many as the class as from us and behind us in our town. Now, now you said class of, of 37? I was a class of 34. Oh, you were the class of 34? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was married in 37. You were married in 37, yeah. I was just thinking of, uh, well, I, I talked with Vernon Dutra and yeah, uh, Margaret Carpenter. Vernon probably graduated, what, class of 36? 37. Oh, he did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now tell me about uh, high school. Uh, uh, they told me they had a lot of fun in high school. How about yourself in class of 34? Well, I'll tell you, for a little boy that came from the country, I had a bearable of fun. As, uh, uh, after I got up to, uh, in my junior and senior year, my brother had uh, graduated from high school, and we had an old Willis night, and uh, I'd fill that old Willis night full of kids, and we, we used it quite a little bit. <laughs> but um, uh, I'll have to say one thing. Compared to the kids today, we were just goody, goody, good kids because um, there was not so many vices that we would get involved in, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I s tried, tried a cigarette or two, but then uh, the kids that we ran around with, uh, none of them smoked. And I, I imagine everybody had tried a cigarette at one time, but it, it never stayed with them, you know, like these kids today. I mean, uh, I go by the school all the time and there would be 20, 25, 30 kids sometimes out, have to get their last cigarette before they go to class. That's just, I think it's bad because I'm a reformed smoker. That's the worst kind of a smoker, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I remember Margaret Carpenter telling me that the thing she especially enjoyed was, was dances. The high oh, school yeah, dances. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had, had a lot of dances and we had to uh, bring in uh, some local boys that maybe two or three instruments, and that's all we needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we just did, uh, did the good things. We didn't fool around any further than that, just punch and dance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we drank punch and dance. <laughs> I, I guess sports is another, uh, another activity you do in high school. That, uh, well, yeah, I, I, coming from a country school, I... Uh, I was not a top athlete by a long way, but uh, we always did have pretty good athletic teams and whatnot. Uh, that, uh, mostly it was consisted of kids that had gone together at the Dixon School and been playing together uh, from the time they were in the fifth or sixth grade, you know. That, uh, I came from a country school. We didn't even have a football. We only had one baseball, and I don't know, somebody lost that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, now a big event uh, everybody keeps telling me about is, is the Mayfair. Uh, yeah, the, the main fair was, uh, to me, when I was six, seven, eight years old, it was a, a bigger event than it is, well, we'll put it that way, it was more local because uh, they would have the parade and the parade, uh, today the parade consists of of cars and horses and fire trucks and and uh, politicians riding and this sort of thing. But in those days, uh, the parade maybe wasn't so long, but maybe we'd have uh, 10 or 15 floats that had been put together with with uh, paper and, and flowers and whatnot, and they the people spent a lot of time on them. They, uh, but uh, it, it's entirely different than it is today. Um, they, uh, uh, and then uh, you'd always, when I was a little kid, uh, I say a little, I would say six, seven years old, eight years old, and I remember we always took a, a basket lunch and we ate uh, our picnic down there at the fairgrounds. After the parade, you'd drive your car down there and park your car, and there wasn't so many people. Where all the buildings are today was all parking, because all there was to the fair was a grandstand, and after after we had a picnic, everybody went to the grandstand. That's all there was. There was no carnival, there was no uh, 
exhibits, there was no FFA, uh, there were no future farmers, there was, it was just, uh, just a place for people to go. And sometimes they'd have a ball game between Dixon and Vacaville. Uh, uh, they would quite often have a, have a relay race between uh, maybe Dixon and Davis or Dixon and Vacaville. Uh, the guys would run 220 yards and uh, see who could beat each other around the, the half a mile track we had. Uh, they'd have some few local horse uh, races, uh, uh, some sometimes pony races, and uh, I know my uncle uh, Kavanaugh, my dad's brother, he was he was uh, well. He was the track marshal down there for oh any number of years because he had a horse that he called Black Beauty, and he was a small man. That uh, when you put him up on top of that horse, now he was a big man, and he would tell you, "Now you get back off the track." <laughs> but uh, he was the only policeman on duty, and he wasn't a policeman; he was just my uncle. <laughs> What about that? You mentioned uh, uh, baseball games, uh, Vacaville against Dixon and Davis. And oh, was yeah. there a lot of rivalry between? There was a and lot of rivalry. Every town had. We had Dixon had the Royer brothers, who were quite uh -huh. baseball players. I talked with Otto. Yeah, uh, Vacaville had the Zupo brothers. There was four or five of them. Davis had the Hoyt brothers, and there was another four or five of them. And no, were, they, were they baseball or football? No, no, baseball. Baseball. Yeah, playing all the big sport. And uh, but they they used to be a lot of competitive games, and I know one year, uh, I don't know whether any of the other local clubs, but I know that uh, uh, Dixon was involved in the in a I don't know whether it was a playoff game or not, but it, the number of people that went from Dixon clear up to Marysville to play Marysville uh, was about half the town went up there. And uh, Dixon won the baseball game. Hmm. And uh, in fact, I think if I remember right, Egg Royer hit a home run in the last inning to win the game for Dixon or some dang thing. But but um, uh, yeah, there was a lot of. And uh, even when I went to grammar school, uh, they used to have a uh, big competition between the little schools. Like at that time, there was there was Pitt School and there was Owen School and there was Allendale and. Occasionally, the teachers used to get together. They'd know the teachers over at another school, and they'd call them over on Friday afternoon. They'd have a, a five-inning baseball game between the kids in grammar school. Of course, sometimes you couldn't feel a, a, a complete team without your teacher paid, but then uh, that's the way it was, you know? Well, uh, you know, another fair, or not fair, but parade I hear about is, is the Holy Ghost Parade. Now, that's yeah, it was quite a quite a thing when it, um, it was kind of run by uh, uh, several of the uh, Portuguese families in Dixon, uh, like the De Mellos and the Dutras and uh, and so forth, uh, and they used to put on a feed out there. And they would kill a a dairy cow and they cook up a lot of meat. And, and uh, about all it consisted of, the feed consisted of, they'd put down a couple of pieces of Portuguese bread and put some meat on top of it with a little meat juice, and that's what you had for dinner. But I, I, if I remember right, you didn't pay much. What they they tried to do, they tried to get a contribution of five or ten dollars was a big contribution in those days, you know. And uh, uh, I remember one time when. I just, well, I don't know, I hadn't been married too long, but anyhow, uh, uh, old Joe Dutra come around for a contribution, and uh, I said, I don't have any money for any contribution. Well, he says, I'll tell you what, he said, here's a ticket, you just come down and eat anyhow, you know, and that's the way it was. Yeah, uh, now you mentioned the Royers. Now, the Royers, what I've heard, uh, two Royers were were uh, mayors of Dixon. Uh, what about uh, the city government? Uh, how things run here? Well, 
this year it didn't run very good, but, <laughs> but as a rule it runs it runs pretty good. Uh, we've had a, um, a reason it probably didn't run very good this year is uh, uh, we've had a terrible influx of new people, and uh, sometimes new people want to change old people, and I think maybe the new people have found out us old people don't change very quick, you know. <laughs> but uh, I think we've always had a, a pretty good uh, city government. Uh, there's always been a lot of interest in it, but it's got to the point now it's kind of bad because if you're in business in Dixon and around the city government, somebody's going to get ticked off at you and you're going to lose some business. And that's why a lot of the, good, the business people have kind of shied away from, from running. Now in the past it, it was business people. Right? Yes, it was business people, downtown people. And, uh -huh. and this sort of thing, but uh, it's kind of got to where, uh, well, newcomers and, and people that are semi-retired and whatnot, about the only people, because if you, uh, it, it just takes so much of your time today. I know that they've been struggling with a budget down there for the last two weeks, and when I was a kid, I don't think they had to struggle with any budget. They just, when they'd have a meeting, they'd decide well how much money they were going to spend, and uh, somebody would make a motion, and they'd pass it. You know, but uh, it's it's so much different today. You've got this reserve fund and that reserve fund and this sort of thing. It's it's and back in my day, when, of course, I never served on a city council, but but uh, I served on enough other things. Uh, Four, five, six different boards at one time, but but uh, uh, I never received a nickel for any of my services. And and today there's just a lot of the the uh, uh, service jobs that I did. Uh, they pay them, <laughs> hmm. which is perfectly all right because but they're much bigger jobs than they were when I was on the different boards and whatnot. Well, now one thing in Dixon uh, in the past was. Uh Pure voluntary fire department. And uh, how'd that work? Did they do a good job? Well, <clears throat> in those days, um, probably everybody that was in Dixon worked in Dixon, and the fire whistle would blow, and everybody was a volunteer. Hmm. When I was in high school, if I was downtown on, on Saturday or Sunday and the fire whistle would blow, uh, Hell, the kids would run over and jump on the fire truck, but that's not that's not true anymore because uh, people are off water skiing or uh, on weekends and whatnot. They don't have a volunteer in that respect. They have a volunteer fire department that, that serves the community well for night fires, but during the day when people are employed, because you back in those days, a fire whistle would blow, and if you were within. Uh, uh, whistling distance of the fire department, you'd run over there, and your your boss would say nothing. But today, you can't do it because you're working in Vallejo or you're working in Sacramento or someplace else, and you don't even hear the whistle, you know? Yeah. Well, um, now, I heard you mention the, the Palace Hotel. Now, that, that was in the family? Uh, well, yes, uh, that was... Uh, See, my great grandfather, the one that tried to sneak back to uh, Connecticut and had the misfortune of the, uh, the boat accident. Yeah. Uh, shortly after that, his first wife died, and uh, uh, then he uh, he married another gal, and they stayed married for several years, uh, and that's when he. Uh, well, he was still running the, the hotel out in the country, but uh, and then she passed away. So when he pa she when she passed away, he moved into town because he was an elderly man at the time, and and uh, he was going to just retire and live at the boarding house in town. Many times here, well, there was a lady by the name of Patterson that owned the Palace Hotel, and the Palace Boarding House, which sets down about where 
oh, the Dixon Tribune office is now. Um, and so he decided to marry her, and she said, well, she said, how about you buying my hotel? <laughs> so anyway, he sold his ranch, so she talked him into buying uh, the hotel and whatnot. And then, of course, she was, they still lived together, but he, he was running this business for, that had been hers. And then, of course, he passed away, and then my, and that was during the era, I believe, of Grover Cleveland, which was a, a very bad, depressed era mm -hmm. in certain places. Anyhow, the, hell, the prices of everything in Dixon went down. I mean, they couldn't sell the hotel, uh, they couldn't sell nothing. And so uh, my grandparents and another one of the grandsons of one of the, well, one of the fellows that married uh, another one of uh, Hall's daughters. In fact, I think at one time there were three of them. They, they just kind of administrated the, the business that was, had to be taken care of at the hotel, and it was just kept as an estate for 12 years. And uh, of course, my granddad was kind of the head of the thing, and, and that's how I came up with just scads and scads of letterheads and bills and whatnot, because uh, when he passed away, my dad was administrator for his estate, and my mother was a keeper of things, and I've got all this historical stuff, uh, mostly just business transactions and whatnot, and mm -hmm. insurance policies and so forth. But um, uh, it, uh, I think it was a profitable deal when it was run, but then when they hit, got into that depression during the, the Cleveland era, and I think it was the Cleveland era, it uh, was quite bad. Um, it just depressed everybody and everything, you know. Now, whatever happened to the to the Palace Hotel? Well, it was sold. I don't know who it was sold to. It's still downtown here. It's still down there. Yes, huh. it's, it's got still a, a hotel. It's got a real estate. The entire upstairs is all closed off now. It's where the real estate is, right across from Dawson's. It's on this. It's the corner of uh, uh, A and First. Yeah. I, uh, we were talking about fires. Uh, do you remember any, any big fires in Dixon? Well, there was a hotel across across the street from the Palace Hotel. That burned down. Uh, oh, that's why I was asking. I thought maybe it was the Palace that burned down. But it was the one across the street. Yeah, it was one across the street that burned down. Uh -huh. uh, I don't remember anything about it. I, I remember the rubble that was left on the, on the air, in the area mm. when I was a kid. Uh, but I, I don't remember anything about the, the hotel. It must have burnt down when I was maybe two or three years old. I just don't remember. What about doctors in town? Did Dixon have any have some good doctors? Well, yeah, we've always had good doctors. I think uh, when I was a kid, our favorite doctor was Doctor Stolly, and uh, but uh, uh, he would make <laughs> house calls way out in the country. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, the kids got the hoop and cough, well, they stayed home and the doctor came to them. <laughs> but today you got to take the kids to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Just the opposite. But uh, he did a good job of serving the community. And there was a Dr. Florth and a Dr. Parsons. They just, I guess they had as good a practice as Dr. Uh, Stolle, but they were, were not our doctors, our regular doctors. But, uh, you know, and there's been other doctors since then uh, that have been good doctors here in town. There's been a couple of not so good doctors, but then that happens in any community. Yeah. Well, let's see. We've talked about a lot of things. Uh, well, you know, something I wanted to ask you about was is uh, being a farmer, a rancher. Uh, what about irrigation? Uh, 
Did you see big changes in, in the development of irrigation? Uh, immense changes. Uh, I really got started the farming. Well, I was uh, married in '37, and I got started farming, uh, developing stuff, but developing ground. I'll put it that way. Um, about uh, '41, '42, uh, kind of the during World War Two, and things got better. I mean. Uh, the price of grain went up to fifty dollars a ton from from fifteen dollars a ton in no time, you know. Wow. And uh, um, and then I got started to to uh, uh, drilling wells and and uh, and uh, developing ground. And uh, in those days, you could drill a well and put in a pump for I would say probably two thousand dollars. Well, today it. Uh, um, it probably cost you thirty or forty thousand dollars by the time you got through with the thing. But but uh, uh, we uh, during the course of so twenty five thirty years we we developed something like uh, twenty five hundred acres in the Tremont area. Uh, we would rent it for cash rent and and then develop it, put down the wells and. And level the ground and put it into row crop, and uh, of course we would uh, we would have maybe a ten year lease on it, but our rent would be down to where a lot of the uh, money that we saved on renting ground would be uh, a good deal for us because we had developed the ground for a, a, a smaller fee, you know, and they were tickled to death because at that time. Um, to give a guy a twenty, twenty-five, say thirty dollars an acre cash rental every year, they weren't making that kind of money. Uh, it was good money for them, particularly where they were, they were elderly and wanted to quit farming. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, we were in kind of in luck. We were out there in the middle of a lot of, a lot of people. Most of them were Germans, but I always got along with them good, and we developed a lot of ground out in that area, and we developed it all in, it was all continuous, I mean, uh, we could just walk from one ranch to the other, which made it rather good. Now back in, in the 20s uh, and the 30s, uh, did you see the uh, crops change? Uh, you said in 1937 you were, you your first crop was sugar beets. Uh, did they do sugar beets back in the 20s, or is that something mm -hmm. new? Well, uh, there, there may have been a few sugar beets in here, but there were sugar beets in uh, in the area uh, long before that. You know, uh, uh, Spreckles, uh, of course that was his sole purpose in life, was to develop sugar, the Spreckles family. But uh, as I understand it, they, they raised some sugar beets in the Dixon area way back in, oh, I would say 19... 17 or 18, but they raised them with no irrigation, and they uh, they tried to plant them early and get them as big as they could when the rains quit. But they only did that for one or two years, and then they quit doing it because they just didn't get enough production out of it. Then they went down into the they went down in around uh, oh in the in the Bay Area where they could plant sugar beets, and there would be enough. Fog. They pick up enough moisture from fog or moist air, or Bay Area and whatnot. And they grew pretty good, pretty good size beets down there. Now hold on a minute. Let me uh, quickly. Oops. I need to put in a new uh, tape. About to run out. Okay, I've got a, a new tape in there. Now you were you were mentioning sugar beets. Say this area is just a little bit too dry for sugar beets, unless it's irrigated. Is that yeah, right? they, uh, but uh, uh, then the, the spreckles got started real big down around Salinas, down in there where there was irrigation, mm. and uh, uh, the beets didn't get started back in here until maybe in the oh uh, early 1940s. Uh, there was uh, a couple of fellows here that raised beets uh, before that, but, but uh, and uh, 
take that back, Liberty Island, that was all an irrigated area uh, off down in this area. Uh, they raised some beets down there because they had irrigation, but they didn't do much with beets in here until we got started developing ground and and uh, so we had ample water for the sugar beets because sugar beets in this area take quite a little bit of water to produce a good crop. So I. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the big three, I guess, of, of the Dixon area would be uh, lambs and barley and uh, what's the third one? Uh, wheat? No. Uh, well, <laughs> in the in the early days, uh, pretty near every ranch had well either either uh, they either kind of went to the sheep or a lot of, a lot of them went to the small dairies. Now in those days, a guy can milk 10, 12, 15 cows, and he considered that a dairy. Today, you wouldn't even you wouldn't even have ten or fifteen cows because uh, and they were all hand milk and this sort of thing. And a lot, of course, none of the, the guys just sold sold cream, and they give the skim milk to the hogs. They didn't have any any use for the hogs. Now there was a couple of dairies around Dixon here that that uh, bottled some milk, but, but they were. Uh, well, they were small, except a Doyle certified dairy out here. But uh, well, then, then Gil, uh, Roy Gill got started with a big dairy. But but uh, for a long time, they were just they were just little small dairies that separated the cream and took the cream into town, put the cream on the train, and sent it down to the to the Bay Area for those people to have cream puffs and stuff. You know, because cream was a, as a, as a product that the bakeries used a lot of in those days and that sort of thing. Huh. So uh, Dixon, I guess you can't pin it down and say, oh, Dixon grows this or Dixon grows that. Dixon has a pretty wide variety of crops, don't Dixon it? Has, a, has a wide variety. During uh, one time, you know, they used to call Dixon a dairy city. Uh, and they used to call Lamb Town, too, didn't they? Well, yeah, that, that came in afterwards, but uh, of course, uh, <coughs> Lamb Town is just a means of making, well, having a little celebration. And all these towns like uh, Vacaville, they have a garlic celebration. There's been no garlic over there for years, or onion celebration, I think. But um, they, uh, uh, Dixon, uh, when they had, well, they had two or three good sized dairies, uh, but then they had a, a lot of, of, of smaller dairies, but then Gradually, the smaller ones phased their, their dairy business out because uh, guys would come along and get started raising beets on the ground that they had in alfalfa, and that's what the Spreckles wanted. At one time, they wouldn't let you plant beets without it was on alfalfa ground. They thought everything was, uh, uh, well, just good would be planted on alfalfa ground, and you would get good production out of beets on alfalfa ground. But then. Uh, during the, oh, about 40, 45, the guys got started raising tomatoes in here, and tomatoes were really, a, well, in fact, they're one of the biggest money-making crops that Dixon has today. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, beets have kind of slid back, and uh, grain is still a pretty good money-making crop, but uh, they don't, uh, uh, they don't uh, have the acreage in grain that they used to because there's well, there's a lot of it goes into safflower and sunflower and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. They raise a few beans here, but they raise a lot of those beans after uh, some other crop has come off. Now, what about uh, uh, orchard crops, uh, almonds? And well, the almonds are coming in uh, pretty strong today, and, mm -hmm. and walnuts. Uh, what about in the 20s and 30s? Uh, were they around then? Well, there was a few little uh, uh, orchard areas, but uh, <clears throat> out here around Dixon proper, there, there was a little orchard area west of town, but but uh, I say little, it's, it was little compared to what uh, an orchard is today. I mean, the guy would go out and put in 160 acres of almonds, well, most of those orchards were 10, 15, 20 acres, because you have to remember back in those days, uh, you didn't have automatic shakers or automatic machinery to take these nuts off. You had to knock all those almonds with a big old pole 
and you had ten acres of Ammons, and by the time you got those ten acres of Ammons knocked onto the ground, you had about all the Ammons you wanted for that year. Yeah, Malcolm Tim, he he, uh, he told me all about uh, the work of knocking those Ammons down. Oh, yeah. Not an easy job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, um, my father-in-law, when I married my wife, he had little five acres over there at Vacaville, and uh, he would get my brother-in-law and me, and well, he'd knock two, but uh, by the time we got through knocking that five acres, we just didn't want to eat any, any almonds either, because we, we had enough of almonds, you know, at, uh, at least at that time, because those trees were, trees that had been planted around, probably around uh, the turn of the century, and they were big trees and big, uh, big limbs. I mean, take a little tree, if it had a, had a small limb, you could hit a, hit a little limb with a stick, and all the nuts will fall off from it. But if you get a limb up there as big as your, big as your arm, it doesn't shake that good, you know. Well, let's see. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, do we? Do we leave anything out? What? 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 What could you tell me about Dixon uh, that maybe we forgot to talk about? Talked a lot of farming, a lot about the town. Well. I guess uh, the main thing with Dixon, and I don't know whether you're going to stop it or not, um, Dixon's just going to continue to grow and grow and grow, and maybe grow beyond everybody's expectations, but uh, it is a, a kind of a, a missing link on the highway between San Francisco and, and Tahoe for eating establishments and uh, uh, Places to live. Uh, a lot of people live here and work in San Francisco and work in Napa or work in Sa uh, Sacramento. And uh, uh, Dixon is, uh, I don't know whether you'd say it was lucky or not, but Dixon's got five exits. And so many of these towns, uh, even Davis doesn't have five exits on a main highway. Uh, and uh, these quick food places and restaurants and whatnot. Motels, they just love that kind of easy off, easy on. Of course, it's still a farming community. I, I have not gone away. Well, I think I think it'll remain uh, farming, but uh, 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 they got they got such big plans. I mean, they got so much industrial ground set aside, and I think they're going to come in uh, as population keeps coming. Towards the coast, because mm -hmm. uh, it's just amazing. And whether they come, population comes from the coast. We bring it in from, the, bring them in from the Orient, and Mexico, and whatnot. You know, we attract a lot of, a lot of people. I think we got 33 million in California now. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're not supposed to talk about the future. We're supposed to talk about the past here. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the Dixon Library for sitting down, taking his time, part of this oral history project. We're going to get oh, better than 30 other people, and yeah. it's going to be a nice thing. We're yeah. going to be able yeah. to, to well, remember I'm, Dixon's I'm glad life. to participate in it. I think it's real nice to have this stuff on tapes and yeah, help videos to, and whatnot. Help to preserve uh, yeah. Dixon. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much. Thank you.